The Young Men's Christian Association was founded in England in the 1840s to provide healthy activities for men. They offered educational programs and instructions in sports like boxing and gymnastics and, of course, swimming. The swimming was done nude because there were no women around, and so suits were unnecessary. The suits were also unhealthy. Those old wool suits harbored bacteria that spread diseases like cholera and typhus, which before the days of effective antibiotics caused fatal epidemics. In the early days, the only way to clean a pool was to drain and refill it, which was generally done every week or 10 days. Chlorination and sand filters were used starting around 1910, but at first they were not very effective and they were difficult to implement. When I posted my request for information on the discussion board, I also received an informative reply from a poster calling himself Jumper. He talks about the history of pool sanitation here. In 1926, the American Public Health Association published the first guidelines for swimming pool management. These guidelines recommended that males swim separately, take a soap shower, and swim nude. Unadorned, undyed tank suits were recommended for women. Keep in mind that women seldom swam in pools since female athleticism was disdained. Even in the 1930s, doctors were writing books claiming that athletic women gave birth to ugly babies. That kind of gender stereotyping shows up in varying degrees throughout the history of nude swimming. APHA guidelines were not written about nude swimming, but about keeping pool sanitary, and that meant keeping the water disinfected. Consequently, male nude swimming was recommended in every edition until 1962. Chlorine was difficult to use effectively because pH had to be managed in addition to having enough chlorine to kill bacteria. It was not until 1939 what was called the break point in chlorination was discovered. It was then possible to make chemical tests that pool managers could use. However, World War II intervened and the equipment to do automatic chlorination was not available until the late 1940s. Even after modern pool chlorination and filtration equipment was available, and modern swimsuits were made out of synthetic materials that were easier to keep clean than the old wool, many school districts and YMCAs continued to require nudity. The Learn to Swim programs offered at the YMCA were very popular, attracting thousands of kids over the years, and most of the time they did not allow suits. This registration form from Lincoln, Nebraska in 1958 is very clear about that. Do not bring a swimsuit. Other organizations followed the same policy. When the Sheboygan, Wisconsin Recreation Department offered a Learn to Swim program in 1954, the announcement noted, boys swim unhampered by suits. Most of the kids swimming in these programs didn't seem to mind that. These two kids don't look unhappy. At that time, there was a cultural expectation that young men would not be self-conscious about group nudity. An example of that is shown in this article from Life magazine in 1941 concerning democracy in school. At Franklin High School in Rochester, New York, democracy is illustrated by the girls' gym class exercising together and the boys' gym class showering together. The kids obviously agreed to be photographed like this, and uh, they don't look upset about it. The kid in front looks like he's just happy he's going to get his picture in a magazine. In 1951, Life magazine published an article about a school outside Chicago called New Trier High School. They included this photo of the boys' swim class. The caption talks about what a great pool it is. The caption makes no reference to the fact that the students are naked because in 1951 there was nothing considered remarkable about that. It's just the way things were done in many places around the country. Going back to the American Public Health Association guidelines, they do make a distinction between genders. At indoor pools used exclusively by men, nude bathing should be required. At indoor pools used exclusively by women, bathing suits should be of the simplest type. Now this is a public health issue. They're trying to keep the water clean. So why should there be different rules for women? The answer is that ladies are allowed to be self-conscious about their bodies. In fact, it was socially expected of them. There were a few instances of girls going against that expectation. 
In the 1947 book, The Administration of Health and Physical Education, the authors write, Nude bathing for boys is practiced universally. In a few schools, girls may swim nude, and this is the most sanitary method. One place the girls swam nude was Detroit, but it was not without controversy. In 1947, there were three elementary schools in Detroit where the girls, as well as the boys, swam without suits. A group of mothers from one school protested to the school board, one mother saying, I see no reason for girls at these schools going swimming in the nude. It is just going to lower their moral standard and get them off on the wrong foot. Another mother says, there is no telling what it could lead to, and we want it stopped at once. The story notes that the nude swimming was done at the request of the girls so they could spend more time in the pool without having to deal with swimsuits. But the school board went along with the mothers and required the girls at Liberty School to wear suits. The other two schools continued to permit nude swimming among the girls. Of course, no one protested about the boys in Detroit swimming nude because society said that was normal. There was nothing improper about young males swimming nude. One example of that social attitude is the 1960 Walt Disney movie, Pollyanna. This is a Disney movie intended for the whole family, so it would never contain anything considered offensive. This movie takes place in a small town. The filmmakers establish that it takes place in a small town with the opening shot. Yep, naked boys in a Disney movie. The filmmakers didn't think there was anything objectionable about this because they'd probably grown up swimming naked and because images of boys swimming naked were commonplace in uh, popular magazines, on the covers, in advertisements, in story illustrations. But the fact is that by 1960, there were some changes in attitudes among some young people. With smaller families, larger houses, and indoor plumbing, a generation of young males had grown up accustomed to having privacy when they were naked, and swimming naked in school was uncomfortable for them. In 1960, in Menasha, Wisconsin, a group of mothers appeared at a meeting of the Board of Education saying that their sons were uncomfortable swimming nude and asked that the high school provide swimsuits for the boys like they did for the girls. Although the school provided swimsuits for the girls, they were optional. The girls could swim nude or not, whichever they preferred. So why not give the boys the same option? The reason, of course, is that nudity among young males had the force of tradition. Real men were not embarrassed about being naked in groups. And the school board wanted the boys of Menasha to grow up to be real men. So the board denied the request. The boys of Menasha High School would just have to learn to act like real men. As the 60s turned into the 70s, swimming naked in school became more of an anachronism. It became more objectionable to more students. In some cases, it was something they looked forward to with dread. On his web blog, A Hole in the Head, John Connors talks about attending Kinsey Elementary School in Chicago, which was connected to Kennedy High School. The swimming pool's slightly frosted windows looked out on our playground. Year after year, during recess and lunches, we would watch the parade of naked boys walking past the window Occasionally, they would lean back against the glass, and we could see their squished buttocks. It terrified me. Someday, I would be on the other side of that glass. The older generation simply did not understand that fear. Group nudity was no big deal to them. But to kids who had never been naked in a group, it was. Something completely out of their experience, and therefore frightening. This was not helped by the fact that some schools were not extremely diligent about protecting the boys' privacy. John Connors says about Kennedy High, There was stadium seating that looked over the swimming pool. This was never locked. And years later, we learned that it was common for the girls to sneak up there and watch the naked boys. Yes, years later, some of the girls admit that they peaked. Such as on this discussion board for alumni of West Junior High in Duluth, Minnesota. Carol writes, Lisa and I were laying on the floor in the girls' shower room looking under the door when the boys were in swimming. I didn't have any brothers, so this was all new to me. Mrs. Turnbloom caught us, but I don't remember what she did with us. Probably sent us to the principal. I don't remember what boys were in that class, probably because I wasn't looking at faces. 
Sometimes schools were careless about their scheduling to keep the boys' and girls' classes apart. This poster describes a scheduling mix-up at his school. Yes, we swam nude and played water polo in gym class. One day, the female gym teacher led about 20 girls in, screaming, You boys get out. It's not your time. We got out. Thanks for triggering that memory. A poster named Larry says, In the 1960s, I attended Wyandotte High School in Kansas City, Kansas. Your story is very familiar. The guys swam en natural. In our case, the girls never entered the swimming pool while us guys were there, but on several occasions, the girl's gym teacher waltzed through. She had to get paperwork from the office. I'm sure that paperwork could not have waited until the class was